What's up, fam, and good morning. I'm Bishop Sylvester Mixon, and I get the wonderful privilege of serving as the lead pastor here at Unity Christian Center. David said in Psalms 122, he said, I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. I'm telling you, when you come in today, have expectation. Expect that God is going to meet you just where you are. I believe as the praise goes up, as the worship goes forth, the prayers uh, reach heaven today and the word of God touches your heart, lives are going to be changed. Souls will be saved. Men will be baptized and people will be set free. We believe today is your day. So have great expectation because God is about to blow your mind this morning. Welcome. Bishop just finished a verified series, but he's at home resting. He had a very hard surgery this past week, and he has a, a two more coming up. Um, so y'all make some noise, because he will be watching this afternoon. Make some noise for our great bishop. <laughs> so he asked that I stand in his stead this morning. Um, he tried to get here, y'all. Y'all pray for the man of God. He has done good. He's y'all sit down. He has rested a, quite a few um, days, but he's been he's got a little bit of cabin fever. Thank you. So he told me on Tuesday that I would be speaking today, and I prepared something else. But Friday night, God woke me up with something totally different. So today we're going to talk about the story of Samson. And for those of you that don't know the story, I challenge you to read the story. It's in, and I actually don't want you to just read the story, but I want you to read Judges 13 through 16. It's too much for us to read today, so we're going to take some snippets of that. Um, but we're going to start in Judges 13 and 1, and we're going to skip around a little bit. So if you have your Bibles, please stand as it is our custom for the reading of the word. I know I just told y'all to sit down. I'm sorry. We exercising today. <laughs> So Judges 13 and 1 says, Again, the Israelites did evil in the Lord's sight. So the Lord handed them over to the Philistines. That touched me because usually God take us out, but he handed them over. He said, handed them over to the Philistines who oppressed them for 40 years. We're going to go to verse 5. In those days, a man named Manoah from the tribe of Dan lived in the town of Zorah. His wife was unable to become pregnant and they had no children. 
the angel of the Lord appeared to Manoah's wife and said, even though you have been unable to have children, you will soon become pregnant and give birth to a son. So be careful. You must not drink wine or any other alcoholic drink or eat any forbidden food. You will become pregnant and give birth to a son and his hair must never be cut for he will be dedicated to God as a Nazarite from birth. He will begin to rescue Israel from the Philistines, the Philistines you just gave him to. We're going to jump to chapter 16, verse number four. So sometime later, Samson fell in love with a woman named Delilah <laughs> who lived in the valley of Sarik. The rulers of the Philistines went to her and said, entice Samson to tell you what makes him so strong and how, we, how he can be overpowered and tied up securely. Then each of us will give you 1,000, I think, 1,000 pieces of silver. So Delilah said to Samson, please tell me what makes you so strong. And what would it take to tie you up securely? Drop down to verse 22. This is our last verse. Verse 22. But before long, his hair began to grow back. So I believe today our sermon title will be, It Ain't a Secret, But It Ain't Your Business. It's not a secret, but it ain't your business. Y'all have a seat. Y'all make me nervous when y'all be standing up. Now, we're going to do a snippet of this story, but I really, really want y'all to go back and read it. Um, it's a really, really good story because the Bible got some drama for you. You know, we be watching the housewives, but the Bible got a whole lot of drama. It's some good stories here. Samson was given a very special ability at birth. He was blessed with tremendous strength that defied logic. When you read it, you will see that he once killed a thousand men with the jawbone of a donkey. He ripped the lion apart with his bare hands. He even carried off the city gates. And y'all know in ancient times, the city gates is what kept invaders and armies out. But he took the city gates off and carried them up a hill like, strong way. Dude was no joke. So Samson was a Nazarite, which means that he could not cut his hair. He couldn't drink alcohol or touch dead things. But like Samson, but Samson had a weakness like most people. We all got weaknesses, right? Samson had a weakness, but his weakness was tail. And not just any tail. When you read the story, you're going to find out Delilah was a prostitute. This wasn't his wife. Samson had a wife. Most people don't know that. Samson had a wife, but he liked some scandalous tail. I know a lot of folks like Samson. I just playing. I'm just playing. I'm just playing. I'm gonna be, they've been playing with me this morning, so I'm a little silly. I'm going to get right. But the, that wasn't the only problem. The other problem that was that Samson had a lot of enemies. Like, Samson had been killing folks. He had been doing a lot of stuff. When you go back through this story, like, he was, he was just on a rampage because he was mad. But here's the thing. God delivered them into the hand of the Philistines. We used to God delivering us out of something, but God delivered them into the hands of, of the Philistines. But he had these enemies. They were out to destroy him. But up until he started running his mouth, he was invincible. Like, nobody could do nothing with that man. Nobody could do anything with you. But let me tell you something. You cannot have an enemy and a weakness at the same time. You cannot have an enemy and a weakness at the same time. And don't play over that. His enemies notice his weakness for women. He noticed his weakness for fast tail women. So they hired Delilah with her fast tail self to find out his secret to his strength. So our first point today is my Bible says that the enemy is crouching like a lion. Like a roaring lion to see who he can destroy. But it ain't, he's, he's not a lion, but he's like a lion. He's watching for prey. But Genesis chapter 49 says the lion, the lion of Judah, shall be on the neck of the enemy. That's what the Bible says. And who would dare rouse him? So the enemy, he always perverts the things of God. So if God is the lion of Judah, he's like a lion, roaring to destroy you. But God says that I am the great I am. So it took Delilah a while. If you go back through that story, she asked him three times, like, 
how, how, where you get your strength from? How can I tie you up securely? And so I don't know if he thought this was some, you know, that they game they was going to be playing. I don't know what he thought. But he, she did different things for three different times, and the enemy came in, and it didn't work. So why didn't he know already? I don't, I don't know why it, why it missed him. But she wore him down. The Bible says that she eventually wore him down. It vexed him to death. And I laughed when I read that because I'm sure me and the kids be vexing Bishop to death. But Samson had a secret that he had carried his entire life. He had a wife who didn't even know his secret. You go back up, that wife didn't even know the secret, but he got with the wrong connection. And she got it out of him. And so the secret to Samson's strength was an agreement that God made with his parents. It wasn't even an agreement that God made with him. So how many know that sometimes your mama's prayers, your grandma's prayers, some agreements and the promises of God that God has made to your grandmama, your mama that you've looked over, you're walking in the promises of God that may not even be yours. You inherit promises. Most times we think we inherit diseases, we inherit problems, but we inherit the promises of God too. Hallelujah. And you know the rest of the story. Delilah lured him to sleep one night. She lured him to sleep. And while he was asleep, she cut his locks to the scalp. So when he woke up, he was bald and he was powerless. And his enemies were hiding outside the door, came running in, arrested him, and poked his eyes out before sending him to prison. All because of fast tale. So this is why we have to be careful who we tell our secrets to. Your business is your business. We have to be careful who we tell our secrets to. George Orwell said that if you want to keep a secret, you must also hide it from yourself. What? <laughs> if you want to keep a secret, you must also hide it from yourself. And then William Downey said to keep your own secrets is wisdom, but to expect another to keep it is folly. So think about that thing. Like, it's so juicy to you. It's so big that you can't even hold on to it till you're going to tell somebody else and you expect them to hold on to it and you couldn't yourself. Make it make sense. And I know a lot of men, they are sitting in prison now doing NFL numbers because they trusted the wrong somebody. And it ain't just men. It's women, too, because we really be rattling off at the mouth. We tell everybody that want to hear, girl, he did it. My child did it. My ba 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 Telling everybody all of your business. But anyway, the part that gets me the most in Samson's story is that he told lies about his strength three times. Three different times. And every time she conveyed it to the Philistines, so bro, like, why are you still telling her? And when you just talking about Samson this morning, now you know you told her your business before and then you heard it again. So why are you still confiding them? Why are you still confiding them? Like, you called your cousin, you told her everything, and then next thing you know, your other cousin came back and told you what that cousin said. But as soon as you and the cousins get together, guess what you're doing? You're telling it to them again. You got to be careful. And I know sometimes that secrets can be prisons, but Proverbs 2019 said that a slanderer reveals secrets. So if they don't revealed your secret before, they're a slanderer. But then I love when it talks about a slanderer in the Bible, that's a mocker, that's a gossiper. So if you know they come to you and they tell you everything somebody said about you, every time you see them, girl, she said this, 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 and then they be laughing like it's cool, but you tell them, you trust them with your business? You do need people, though, that you can be vulnerable with. I'm not saying, like, keep everything and be hoarding it to yourself, but you got to be careful who you tell your secrets to. If somebody have already, what is it, I think Maya Angelou said, if somebody shows you who you, they are, believe them. If they showed you this, and I know we be, but we, you know, we say, we think everybody changed in the blink of an eye. Look how long it took you to change. You do need people that you can be vulnerable with and then tell every, and that's not going to tell everybody your business. Watch them. You need people around you that don't use your vulnerability against you. So even if they don't tell your secret, but you told them, hey, I got this weakness, but then when they get mad at you, they throw it back up at you? That's not really the friend that you need. But I don't want to just put the blame on Samson because he trusted this girl. He loved the girl. He said he loved Delilah, but Delilah had the heart of a beast. I'm talking about like, she, she was Samson. Just think about what it took for Samson to fall in love. This was a powerful woman. Because Samson had a wife he was done with. He going through killing everybody, and she won his heart. She had the heart of a beast, but she folded on him. 
sometimes we can forfeit our promises of God because we talk too much. So it's necessary that we walk in the spirits and we use wise judgment. Proverbs 25 and 9 says, don't portray another person's confidence. So we can't be around talking all our business to everybody either. But we like to do that. Somebody tell you something, you can't wait to tell somebody else. You got to be mindful of that. Because we can't just blame, you know, Samson for telling her. We got to blame her for talking too much. Point two, you cannot function out of your feelings. He was in love with this lady. But you can't function out of your feelings and operate in purpose. Decisions that are purpose purposeful are made from your head and not out of your emotions. And I know a lot of times we hear, follow your heart. I'm going to follow my heart, follow my feelings. Too many people in the kingdom of God are operating out of their emotions and out of their feelings. And I know y'all have heard that before, but I'm, I'm, I'm just not feeling it today. Call me on Thursday. I might be feeling it then. You're missing opportunities because you're operating on how you feel. You can miss success most times when you're operating out of your emotions. Miriam Webster says that the head is the chief, is the principal. But what really stuck out to me, it was described that it contained your sense organs. So, you know, we were kids, we learned our five senses. We got touch in our, in our skin, but most of our senses are in our head. This is chief. This is ruler. So you break networks when you operate out of your emotions. A person that doesn't operate, a person that operates out of their head, they have no government. Your head is chief. This is government. This is the reign and authority. But if I'm operating out of my feelings all the time, I'm never operating out of, a, out of authority. And you can forfeit the things of God that he's giving you in your government because you're operating out of your feelings based on how you feel. So do not be conformed to the world. It's the, it's, be not, do not be conformed to the world. It's the word of God. But be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. Not the renewing of your heart. It's the renewing of your mind. God wants you to renew out of your mind because then it goes on to say, it says that by testing, you may discern what is the will of God. You ain't discerning that out of your heart. You're not discerning that out of your emotions. You're not discerning that out of your feeling. It said, but you'll discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. But when you're operating out of your feelings, you don't know what's good. You don't know what's acceptable. And you don't know what's perfect. You discern from your head. You don't discern from your heart. So you cannot follow your heart. Following your heart is not biblical. The Bible says over and over, revive your heart. Not renew your heart. Not think out of your heart. It's, it's, it's you, you think out of your mind. And there are too many headless people in the kingdom of God. A long time ago, Bishop would tell us about decipher feelings versus facts. Or feelings versus truth. He would tell us that all the time. But I'll show up hand, how many people in the room are in management? or lead or have led in some type of capacity. Got a good bit of hands. So have you ever, or I know you know somebody, it's hard to work with people who operate out of their feelings. So when you criticize their work, they think you're criticizing them. Or you criticize how they did the assignment, then they think you're criticizing them. And so now you're having to take time instead of moving forward to babysit an adult or babysit somebody that's called to an assignment because they get in their feelings. It's hard. It's, I'm telling you, management is so hard. Leading is so hard when so many people are headless. So many people are in the fence. Baby, just get the work done. I'm not talking about you. I don't have time to have that extra conversation. You didn't do the work like it was asked. We gave you some outlines. It's your job description. This is what you need to do. So maybe I can help you do it and show you how to do it. But no, I got to take all this time and build you back up because you all in your feelings because it wasn't the way we wanted it. Amen, church. First Psalms 3 and 1. And I've been in my feelings too before. Bishop had to light me up, y'all. He ain't table one time. First Samuel 3 and 1. And so, oh Lord, I have so many enemies. So many are against me. No, first Samuel. Meanwhile, the boy Samuel served the Lord by assisting Eli. Now, in those days, messages from the Lord were very rare and visions were quite uncommon. 
because they were operating out of their feelings. The word of the Lord, it comes out of your mouth. Visions come out of your eye. This is all in your head. And so I said before that you didn't have visions. You didn't know what was good. You didn't know what, accept, what was acceptable. You didn't know what was perfect when you're operating from here. You're not getting it there. It comes from your head. My notes are all messed up, guys. But there's references in the Bible where your blessings are laid upon the what? When a man is getting ready to die and he's going to bless his children, where did he put the blessings? On the head. He anoint the head. He don't anoint the heart. When a man gets ready to bless his child, he anoints his head. He doesn't anoint his heart. He anoints his head because the head is what he's going to operate up, discern from, make decisions from, make choices from. But too many of us, we're making choices from I'm just following my heart. My heart, I feel in my heart. I don't care about what you feel in your heart. What do you know in your head? You shall know the truth and the truth shall set you free. You don't know in your heart, you know in your head. So our next point is God is a merciful God. Even though Samson lost his strength and his position at the top, God and his great mercy allowed space for redemption. And that's what he does for us. Because I know I don't operate it on my heart a whole lot. I still operate on my heart sometimes. My heart feels oh, my heart so tender. And I'll make decisions that I shouldn't make because my heart is tender. And y'all know we do that. We start feeling sorry for people that we really need to rebuke. We start looking over stuff that we know really getting to us, but we don't address it because I don't want, you know, I don't want to hurt them. I don't want to hurt their feelings. But then your feelings hurt. You all upset. You all offended. But you worry about death because you operating out of your heart. God is a confrontational God. And I ain't telling nobody to get in nobody's face and be ugly, but God is confronts things. When I am wrong, God confronts me. Let me tell you a story. Yesterday, I was walking down the steps. I was praying for my kids, just walking through the house praying. And I was like, God, I'm just tired of all this dead weight. Take this dead weight off me and Bishop. And God said, dead weight is how you get stronger. Oh. Like, what, God, what? You want to say that to me? God confronts us immediately, but we go weeks and weeks and weeks, especially wives and husbands. Now, wife, you, husband, you know you mad at that wife, but you don't say that because you don't want her, you don't want to have her in the bed, she don't want to give you none. You just want, you just go, you're going to avoid it. Wife, you know he made you mad, but you don't want to address it because you don't want to start nothing. God ain't like that. God confronts us immediately. So, I mean, confront in wisdom. But God made space for redemption. And the part that fascinates me the most is in verse 22. We'll read it again. It says, however, the hair on his head began to grow back after it had been shaven. Now, this didn't happen suddenly, but over time, he went to prison. He was away in prison for so long. He was powerless. He was blind. He was heartbroken. And no doubt of feeling abandoned. Because here's the thing, y'all. We be feeling abandoned. We be mad at God when this was the choice I made. If I hadn't told her my business, my hair never would have been shaved. I never would have got my eyes gorged out. I never would have went to prison. But then I'm mad at God. God, why you allow this to happen to me? I thought I was your promised one. I thought I was going to deliver the Philistines. But then I gave myself. Y'all know this? that's what we do. We do. But I love that. He says that the hair grew back after it was shaven. But here's the thing, in spite of everything he did wrong that landed him in such a jacked up situation, God never took his eyes or his hand off Samson. And can somebody just praise God for that today, that God never took his hands off of us? God is a God of covenant. He is a man of his word, if you will. Watch this, though. Y'all watch this. Y'all going to get ready to shout because I was shouting all in my room. And I read this story so many times. God, our God, purposely tied his promise to his hair. He could have tied his promise to his hand, to his foot, to his arm, but hair grow back. Hair grows back. So that means he really didn't want to keep the promise for him for real. Maybe it was a lesson that he was going to learn because God knowed us from the beginning. And he knew that the hair problem was going to cut off. But his promises, he didn't take his hand off of them because he knew hair can't grow back. 
So your promises are not without repentance. You know, people say, if you don't use it, you lose it. That's a lie. God is a man that he will not lie. God is a man of covenant. And so when he makes you a promise, his promise is still good. No matter what choice you made, no matter who you slept with, no matter who you cussed out, no matter who you fought, no matter who you offended, his promises for you are still good. And about the right time his hair grew back. It took a while. God let him sit in that thing for a while. And some of us are sitting in our thing for a little while. And we just wonder, like, God, are you going to ever redeem me? God, I know I messed up. And then the enemy is so just dirty. Oh, my God. He's so dirty. He'll get you to yourself and condemn you. You'll be sitting in prison. You stop reading your Bible. You stop praying. You stop coming to church because of the choice you made. You make a choice, especially the choices that show to other people. Then you get shame and you stay at home. Baby, don't be shamed. Because if we pull and open up everybody's closet, they can't condemn you when they got their own skeletons. And let me tell you something, Bishop and I ain't never condemning you. Shame of how you running and ain't nobody chasing you. Ain't nobody chasing you here. And I'm saying that to kill a demon because we go through too many things and then we go home and we sit home and we get out of the will of God and we begin to lay over in our sin, lay over in our pain, but the promises of God are still good. What God said about you, can't nobody change it. Because he's a God of covenant. (laughs) He's a God of covenant. He's a man of his word. But I do want to say this thought to you. It doesn't matter how bad you mess things up in your life. God's covenant doesn't change. And he made his ultimate covenant when he gave us his son. We were on his mind. He knew all the things we were going to do. He knew all the things we was going to say. I'm telling you, let me tell you something. If y'all call my brothers right now, they'll tell you all I did was fight. All I did was cuss people out. All I did was roll my eyes. But God knew maybe 20 years later, I'll be standing here helping to make heaven bigger. That his promises were still good for me. His promises are still good for you. And I'm going to tell you, this: ain't no sin bigger than no other. And society will make you feel like you are so wrong because you did this and all they did. All they did was that. Mm -mm. God look at it all the same. But when God look at you, he don't look at bad. He said in the beginning, it was good. And that mean was is still good. You're still good. When God looks at you, and in my mind, and and this may be crazy, but in my mind when I pray to God, I always say, Lord, cover me in the blood of Jesus. I say that all the time. So I look at myself when I think of, when I imagine me praying to God, I imagine that I'm covered in blood and God can't tell me from Jesus. That when he look at me, all he sees is his son. When he looks at me, all he sees is his daughter that's hurting, that's bleeding, but I'm covered in that blood. That he's redeeming me every time he looks. That's what I think. But then you know the other thing that I think about when I'm covered in that blood. That the enemy don't know me from Jesus. He don't know who on that cross. He don't know who covered in his blood. He don't know who nails in there. He don't know who that is. So we got to say that every day. We got to have a a place of prayer too. And we're doing it. We're making these decisions and making these choices. But he said in the right amount of time his hair grew back. As long as you're still breathing, Jesus is still Lord. Your hair can grow back. God's purpose for your life is bigger than you. God's promise for your life is bigger than you. It's bigger than your situation. It's bigger than the divorce. It's bigger than the rape. It's bigger than a child out of wedlock. It's bigger than you cussing somebody at work. It's bigger than the job you got. It's bigger than the job you didn't get. It's bigger than the degree. It's bigger than your status. It's bigger than a relationship. It's bigger than all of that. It's bigger than the opportunity. It's bigger than your capacity. 
is bigger than your abilities. But we got to know it. And a lot of times we don't know it because we don't spend enough time in prayer. We go to God and we just, we just start praying everything. And then we get up. And we get up in the morning. We have this routine. Most of us, we got a, a prayer in the morning, a prayer in the night. And that's it. We, we check the box. I prayed today. But the Bible says we should pray without ceasing. What's the only other thing in life that we do without ceasing? Breathing. So imagine if I get up in the morning. I had Bishop look this up this morning. How many breaths a day we take? And it was 20,000. So imagine I get up in the morning, I'm going, <laughs> check the box, I did my breathing for today. What if I did that? I'm going to end up dying, right? Physically, and we do that because physically I know I got to breathe. But spiritually, we got to pray. And we say, God, how do I pray without ceasing? I got to go to work. I got to talk to my kids. I got to go to church. How am I going to pray without ceasing? When you build yourself up in the word, you get the word in your head. I'm telling you, as soon as I wake up in the morning, and I ain't no special person at all, but I do be in my word. So as soon as I wake up in the morning, there's a song of the Lord on my heart before I can even say anything. All throughout the day, when you, you, you riding through the car, you walking in the house, and you got this, this worship song here, that's God speaking to you. And we say, I don't know what God sounds like. That is God talking. And start to, start to look at those words and say, okay, what, this song, what song is this? And when you think about that song, that's his word, that's his word for you for that day. You, can, you ain't got to have no prayer like, no, no, like we pray in church with all the words. You don't have to. God just wants you to talk to him. I'm serious. Yesterday, as I was praying, I'm walking through Josh's room. I hope he ain't here yet. And the room was so dirty. And I was like, I'm, I, the room was dark. I didn't want to wake him up. I was going in and annoying him. And it was so dark, I couldn't see. And as soon as I walked in the room, I hit some. I said, Lord, you said that you'll be a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. Don't let me fall and bust my head in this room, God. That's all he want. That's all he want. Then I walked out of his room. I hear Milo barking. And God bless big head Milo with his loud mouth. It ain't got to be fancy. It don't, those are the sentiments of my heart. So when I get up here and I pray an eloquent prayer, God know that it's just for y'all, just so y'all can know the word of God, because I don't talk to him like that. I don't talk to him like that. I think Sister Latasha sent me a video the other day that says, Lord, um, burn up this belly flat in Jesus' name. I said, see, that's how I talk to God. <laughs> burn it up, God. I present it as a living sacrifice. But God is bigger than our decisions. And y'all know we got decisions. God gave us choices. He gave us decisions. But our holy God is bigger than all of that. He's bigger than anything that we can do for ourselves. We have to trust God's mercy. We got to trust God's mercy for us. Because here's the thing. We do trust God's mercy. We just think it don't apply to us. We just think, okay, I don't know all the words. I ain't read my Bible in two weeks. I've been catching up for four weeks. So that mercy don't really apply to me because I ain't in his hand. You still in his hand. Because if you won, baby, you wouldn't have woke up. He woke you up because you were on his mind. God said, girl, let me get her up today. Let me get up EP today. I need him today. That's how he is. So we have to trust the mercy of God and the plans of God. And now we always hear how God is, he's always mindful of, his, mindful of us. He is. He's mindful of you. You can play softly. He's mindful of you. And there's people in this room that have lost parents. There's people in this room that have lost children. There's people in this room that have had setbacks. Um, did God do that? That ain't what I want to discuss today. But I come to say that his purpose and his plan for you was still good. This is still the day that the Lord has made. I will still rejoice and be glad in it. And I think I told y'all a few months ago when grandma passed that I was sitting on the couch and I had just buried my brother's mom, had just buried my brother. A few months before that, we had just buried my father-in-law. And I was sitting on the couch like, God, and I would look, I'm going to church tomorrow. I'm still going to serve you. I'm still going to praise you. Like, what you want, bro? But I know that there is a plan in all of it. 
So as I was thinking through that, through all of that, I quit one of my jobs. I, um, I won't say one that was my job. I quit my job last summer. Cause I was just so stressed out. I said, I had gone to them, I'm like, guys, look, I just, I can't function on all these numbers every day. I just need some time off. They just kept begging me to stay, begging me. Like, well, just do two more weeks, three more weeks. And I end up quitting. And when I quit, let me tell you, that set me up for the best job I ever had in my life. So I had to go through all that stress of every day going into work, going to the bathroom, crying because I don't want to be there. I want to be at home. I'm stressed out. I'm hurting. My daddy is sick. We just buried my father-in-law. God, my mind ain't on this job. I just want to be at home, but we need insurance, God. But I quit that job. Bishop said, we'll, we'll figure it out. I stayed at home for a month. Baby, I was cooking and cleaning. I was so happy. And then another job I didn't even, I didn't even apply for. They reached out to me, and it's the best job I could have ever had. And in six months, I was promoted to a senior position, and not just for a national company, an international company. And then this week, we had some problems at work, which I end up having to be on the phone with the VP of not just the national, the international, getting to see me act up at work. That wouldn't have happened if I didn't go through all of that last summer. So the things that you deal with, the things that you go through, it's not the end. When, when God closed some door, I promise there's never been a door in my life that God closed and I didn't go through a better door. Never. My last relationship, I didn't know how I was going to make it without him. But would you look at me around right here living? That's for some of y'all that's going through some relations. Look around, baby. I'm still living. I'm happy. I've been happy. So when God closes the door, that's not the end. Y'all send so we can pray. Samson's hair grew back. The ministers are coming. God uses the stuff that don't make sense sometimes. God uses the stuff that didn't make sense with Sam. It didn't make sense. But he ended up killing more people at the very end that he had killed his whole life. And that man had killed thousands and thousands of people. But in that one, mo one moment, God he let his hair grow back at the right time. And he killed and wiped out the Philistines and freed his people. But God had to allow all his decisions, all his choices, just like ours. And we're in this room, we've made some choices before. Some of us still got some good choices to make. But here's an opportunity to make a choice. Here's an opportunity to make the choice, not a choice, the choice. I promise Jesus is the best choice I ever made. And I'll tell you, God asked us to present our bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable. Being saved is a sacrifice. I'm telling you, sometimes I want to sleep in on Sunday morning, but I'm going to get here because it's a sacrifice to me so y'all can see me pressing and know that y'all can press. It's a sacrifice not to slap people sometimes and have to dumb it down and let them be the, and be the bigger person. It's a sacrifice. It's a, I'm, it's a sacrifice. But God wants us to make that sacrifice. But when you make a sacrifice, you know what happens in the Bible days when they made a sacrifice and they laid it on the altar. God killed all that flesh, but God was exalted in his most holiest. There was an aroma that smelled so sweet to God. God, I want to smell sweet to you. Anybody in this room know they've been a little funky. <laughs> That's your opportunity to smell good. <laughs> This is your opportunity for God to walk up on me, walk up on you, and be like, "Oh, what you got on? You smell good, God. I just got on you. That's that's you, God. That's your new, that's your new fragrance. And not only will God smell it, people around you will smell it. You'll go on your job and they don't talk to you crazy like they used to. They recognize your kids have some respect to you, that respect for you that they didn't used to have because they recognize you smell good." His promises about you are good. They still good. So Lord, we thank you today, God. We thank you, God, that you are the covenant keeping God. God, that even when we broke covenant with you, God, you didn't break covenant with us. <laughs> God, I 
thank you, God, that even when we break covenant with you, you never break covenant with us, God. No matter how we treat you, God, you just let us wag our tails on back to you, God. And we thank you for that, God. We thank you, God, for being a stationary God. We thank you, God, for being a God that don't move, God, that every time we move from you, God, you don't move from us. And I thank you for your word, God, that says that if we draw nigh to you, God, you'll draw nigh to us, God. So, God, help us in this moment, God. Every person in this room, God, that's been separated from you, God. Every person from this room that needs to move a little close, God. I thank you, oh God, for motivation and discipline, oh God, to move towards you, God, so that you can move into our situations, God. Move into our minds, oh God. Move into our authority God move into our government God move into our vision God move into our perception God move into our capabilities move into our abilities God God we can't do nothing without you God we think we got it all together but Lord let your will be done Lord we crucify our wills in this place God we crucify our own desires God but we swap them out for what you want for us God so we ain't got to be going through the crooked path all the time, God. Take us on the straight path, God. Because, God, you said that you would be with us, God. And then you said, oh, grace and mercy will be following, God. And we need your mercy. We need your grace every day, God. Lord, we thank you for your promise, God. Thank you for everything you said about us, God. Thank you, God, that we're the apple of your eye. Thank you, Lord, that we're the first and not the last. Thank you, God, we're blessed going in and blessed going out. We thank you for that now, God. Because we don't deserve it, God. None of us deserve anything. You said that we were as filthy rags, God. But I thank you for your washing, God. The washing of the water of the word, God. That you clean us up, God. And you present us, God, before men, God. Blameless and clean, God. And I thank you for every blameless person in this room, oh God. I thank you for every person, God, that you have cleaned up and washed, God. And that's all of us, God. So wash us now, God. Make us holy, God. Make us more like you, God, because we already like you. We don't know it, but help us to see it, Jesus. So, Lord, we thank you and we give you glory. In Jesus' name, amen. You have an opportunity to this morning to be planted. The Bible says that you flourish in your place of assignment. And blessed are those that are planted in the city of our God. And for those that are without a church home, those that don't have a place of, of planting right now, we want you here. There's such a beautiful garden here. Look at all these flowers. Such a beautiful garden. And we're growing, we're flourishing, we're nourished. And if you need to be planted, this is a place. We want you here. We won't turn you away. Anybody in the room that needs prayer, our ministers are here for prayer. Doesn't matter what it is, you can come and get prayed for this morning. <laughs>